Just over seven months ago, Sky News broke the news that Sir Martin Sorrell had left the world's biggest advertising and marketing services agency after 32 years at the helm. Headlines over the reasons for that departure, reports of misconduct and a row over his remuneration followed. But just weeks later, he started all over again, founding rival group S4 Capital. It's just made its second major acquisition, buying San Francisco-based advertising technology firm Mighty Hive for $150 million. Sir Martin Sorrell joins me now. Martin, Good great evening. to see you. So what is Mighty Hive? Mighty Hive is a programmatic media planning and buying business, which means it, it buys uh, advertising on the, on the web, uh, digitally, but through algorithms. Uh, it's highly targeted advertising. Use the content that we have in, within S4 Capital, so by, produced by Media Monks, which is a digital content firm, and then deploys that, distributes it through media planning and buying, technologically based media planning and buying through the world. So what are you trying to achieve with S4 Capital? Well, I, I looked when I, when I left or was ejected or electrocuted, however you put it, at, uh, at uh, WPP. Uh, I looked at the growth areas of WPP and I think there were three. One was digital content, so Media Monks was our first deal and we bought a 10 country, 12 office operation just opened in San Francisco, uh, based originally in Holland, but focusing on digital content of, of all kinds, particularly in advertising. So that was one area. Second area was media planning and buying and Mighty Hive, as I just said, yeah. represents that. So bringing the two together, fueled by what we call first party data, which means client data or platform data. So the sort of data that Google has or Facebook has or Amazon or Tencent or Alibaba that, that we can use to educate the content that we develop and educate the media planning and buying we do so that we're highly targeted. Uh, we understand how consumers are purchasing goods and services in a, in a more modern way uh, and, and their tastes and preferences in a more sophisticated technologically based way. So what are the gaps in the portfolio? What, what do you have well, to do Well, I think the, the train set is, is almost complete. I, I think it's probably three quarters, seven eighths of the way there. Probably I'd like to do a little bit more in the content area. Media Monks is very strong, but it's still small. I, I've described it as a peanut or maybe it's a morphing to a coconut. But uh, we're certainly, uh, we're not a big company. We're more a motor torpedo boat than a, an aircraft carrier. Uh, and, and I think what we have to do is perhaps enliven even more our content part of our, our business, and maybe a little bit in the first party data area. But we really have got uh, two, two companies which are very, very strong in content and media planning and buying. And I think the acid test for us is now going to be how we can broaden and deepen a very good client list. We have an excellent client list based in packaged goods, based in technology, in financial services, in hospitality, in a number of areas. But what we have to, they're, they're not big relationships, they have to be broadened and deepened. So what I'm looking for now is we have the access, uh, I think, for our, for our two companies and working together uh, in a sophisticated way. What we have to do is to deliver once we have the access and convert. What about those clients? I mean, this is a period of immense disruption. We've seen industries... That's the well, opportunity. Well, we've, but we've seen banking disrupted. We've seen yeah. media disrupted. A lot of these traditional be our, our own industry yeah. be direct. but FMCG the likes of Unilever yes. Procter & Gamble they are facing immense disruption are they going to have the money to pay advertisers well, men like you 40 as as they did 40 <laughs> percent of their budgets are going on digital so the world is I mean the advertising and marketing services is about a trillion dollars about 500 billion in the old stuff 500 billion in, in the with di different stuff the 500 billion in the traditional area of that now 200 billion is in digital that's enough to go around. It is, uh, in fact, in terms of absolute cost, a cheaper area to penetrate. Uh, it is more targeted. It is more accurate. It is more sophisticated. There, there are more measurement metrics than you, than you have. You know, the old saying, I, I know I waste half my advertising, but I don't know which half. I think probably in digital, you, you know you waste 25% or 15%, but you don't know which 15 or 25%. So it, it's much easier to identify the cost. Now, our mantra, interestingly to your point, is faster, better, cheaper. In a world since Lehman, since 19... Since 08, since 2008, in a world where there's very little inflation, where nominal GDP growth as a result is less than it was pre layman where there's very little pricing power, the, the, the onus on the clients is to, to, to focus on costs. And that's what we have to respond to. So the mantra of faster, being faster in an always-on, 24-7 digital world, you're almost running political campaigns. I mean, they go on for longer than political campaigns, but it's almost the same. And the, the velocity uh, and the, 
the, the vibrancy of the, of the campaigns is very strong. So faster is very important. Better means utilizing new technology in more sophisticated ways and using all forms of AI, VR, virtual reality, augmented reality in very sophisticated voice in very sophisticated ways. And then probably the most important is to be more efficient. Because in most companies, the finance and procurement function has become much more powerful. I would say in the last 10 years, the balance has shifted from marketing to finance and procurement. I don't think that's right because top line growth will always be the determinant yeah. where you go. I mean, that okay. conditioned the way I looked at S4 Capital when I left WPP. So what about that departure from WPP? What yes. are your reflections on it seven months on? It's well, pretty I, brutal. I, I, uh, I would say I'm sad about it in, in, in a way. I mean, WPP is not today, for example, you know, we see another uh, lurch downward in the, in the share price. And I, you know, I, I, I worry about it. Obviously, I'm still a major shareholder. As you yeah, reminded me before we came on the front. Yeah. Yes, I'm still a top 10 shareholder. I think probably the, the largest individual shareholder. So I, I care very much about its future and future development. Uh, S4 Capital is a very different model. I, I don't think it's competitive, really. I mean, you can't compare a $150 million revenue company with $20 billion. I mean, they're operating in very different, different areas and different ways in many respects. I mean, we do collide uh, on, on occasions in both the acquisitions, actually, that we made, uh, Media Monks and Mighty Have. I think WPP was a bidder, so I guess it's 2-0 yes. uh, <laughs> halfway through the first it, half. Of the it's moment. that personal for you, then? You're really trying to put one no, over it's on not. Them. It's not personal. I mean, yeah, I was asked, Gideon Spanier of Campaign asked me, you know, is, uh, is, is there a revenge motive there? And I said, well, no. But, you know, if ever there, there was a revenge element to it, it, it the, the challenge is to build, coming back to your questions, the new age, new era model that will be successful. I mean, what I really want to do, and my colleagues want to do, Media Monks, and Mighty Hive is put together a probably a, a revolutionary rather than evolutionary but a revolutionary disruptive model that appeals to clients in terms of the content that we create for them in that 24 7 always on world and the way that we deliver it in terms of programmatic or media planning and buying that's a real because when I think back on my, my last uh, sort of year or so at uh, WPP there were three or four things that I saw where there was true differentiation yeah. that what we did clearly marked out a difference so what we're trying to do here is, is to create a new model which is very different from what's come come before very much attuned to the disruption that you talked about, which affects all industries. But there were some very lurid headlines surrounding your departure. I mean, that, that well, must have wounded you. Well, it, it didn't wound me. I mean, the, the fact of the matter, when you, when you read articles, they refer to the, those, those allegations, right, which was a way that newspapers get around any legal yes. problems. Uh, they failed to point out that there was an investigation. And what that investigation found, found me as a good lever and found nothing material. So they, they sort of, the report half the story and they don't report the other half, which is, again, investigation, good lever, departure. There's I decide, no ongoing legal action? No, there's no, no, against me, no. Yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things, I mean, you're, you're 73 years old. Yes. You've, you've amassed more money than you can spend in this world or the next. What's made you go and do it all again? What well, you, I've, I've had, to, I've had three lives, not, not yeah. nine lives. I think <laughs> there were another six to go. Yeah. But, um, I had three lives, one with the Sarches, uh, one with WPP, and now with one with S4 Capital. I mean, I can't see myself retiring to the beach or on the golf course. I think golf is for old men. I've, I've probably offended a lot of people out there. Um, so, I, so I, and I can't see myself doing a portfolio series of things, but I, I really want to remain active. I think when you retire you know, and you, you are inactive, that has, uh, I think, mental and physical effects. Um, on people from what I've seen so I think keeping active is really important and I enjoy this um, you know we've had it hasn't been an easy six months but we've now I set myself a target of doing three things actually by Christmas and we've done two um, so I'm very pleased with the progress we've made uh, well, you prior do things to the, differently at S4 Capital than you did it yes w it's a unitary structure so so the board we have now four uh, non-executive directors, so we have a fourth that we add through the funding, Dan Daniel Pinto from Stanhope. The executive directors of Media Monks, Victor Knapp and Wesley Taha, will join from Media Monks. Uh, and Peter Kim, Pete Kim, uh, and Christopher Martin will join from Mighty Hub. So we'll have those four, myself as executive chairman, plus the non-executive So it'll be a, a unitary board. I think there is a real issue 
uh, I know this is a somewhat controversial thing to say, but here goes. I mean, rather like fund management, where you have the split between performance and governance. In companies, I think you're getting the split between sort of the chairman and general counsel. There's a sort of process line, and then there's a performance line with the CEO and the management, and, and there the two will meet. And, and I think, you know, the, the split structure is probably a better structure than the concentrated structure in, in America, where you have chairman and CEOs as one person with a senior independent director. But the danger is, you know, if the, if the chairman or chairwoman is uh, not comfortable in his or her T-shirt or not comfortable in, in themselves and don't feel that they've got the T-shirt, uh, there are some tensions that can creep in there. And, and, you know, you have sort of split leadership and split responsibility and sometimes I think that can be unhealthy. I mean the best chairman, um, Phil Lader was a great chairman yeah. of, of WPP, uh, Hamish Maxwell, I think, you know, who ran what was I think for one quarter the biggest company in the world, Philip Morris, bigger than Citibank at that time. But you know he'd been there, done it, didn't, was not trying to, to grandstand in any way as chairman and was very sage advisor and, uh, and confident. But will you be personally different, though, as a leader, have you, following what happened at WPP? Is, is your well, we're, we're, all, we're all conditioned by our experiences, you know, good, bad or indifferent. Um, the true test of anybody, I think, is, is really not how you deal with the good things. Dealing with the good things or the good times is easy. It's how you deal with the tough times, Ian, so I think is absolutely critical. And, you know, how you re rebound from, from um, adversity or... Uh, or challenges or, or you know, the way, where you made the right or wrong decisions. Now, look, you're a renowned reader of the economic runes. What do you make of the Brexit debate and what it's doing to the UK economy? Well, I, I, I think for some time people have been on hold, at the very least. I mean, I think some people have been postponing, you've been discussing before we came on air, that people are postponing making decisions, and I think that's been bad for the economy for a long period of time. Ironically, in the advertising business, one of, the, one of the puzzling things was in over the last year or so, the UK has actually been quite a strong market. And why is that? Well, I think it's because people have been refraining from capital investment, fixed plant investment, increasing capacity. And what they've been more likely to do to is invest in brands, sort of tickle up sales or hold market share or increase market share through increased ad spending and marketing spending to try and stimulate sales. So I think this sort of had a slightly paradoxical effect because usually in times of uncertainty, people cut back. But I, I, I just can't see anybody making a major investment decision with the degree of uncertainty that we see going on. And, you know, we were talking before also about what's going on in France with Macron's yeah. ratings and the, and the challenges to his leadership there, what we see in Germany with a change of leadership, what we see in Italy uh, with the, the coalition there, you know, a, a left and right wing populist uh, regime, at least temporarily, I think, uh, and then what we see in Spain. So. Ironically, you know, if I was a Brexiteer, which I'm not, I'm a, very much a Remainer, and I would like there to be a second referendum, although I doubt whether that will happen. But if I was a Brexiteer, I'd be looking at Europe and saying to myself, my gosh, they are in a bit of a pickle. Quite. I mean, but, but what about Theresa May's deal? I mean, do you, th do you think it's a, a decent compromise for British business? Well, I don't know the, the intricacies of the negotiation. It, it's not what I would like to have seen, and I think the backstop uh, issue is an issue. Uh, I mean, I find it a little bit ironic that we're being told to take this deal because there's nothing else on offer. I mean, it's not the right way, I think. We should take the very best deal that we can possibly negotiate, not the only one that we were able to negotiate, in my view. But uh, I, my guess is, for what it's worth, we, we did a fundraising, uh, as you know, around the city last week, and I think the general consensus was that whilst the, the first vote might go against the Prime Minister, ultimately the sec second vote might go uh, with a, maybe with a few modifications. All right, interesting stuff. All right, so Martin Sorrell, we've got to leave Thank it you, there. Ian. Great Thank you to very see much. you. Good Thanks to see you too. Thank you.